Good morning, peoples. We're here. Mark needs a pen, so he had to go get one. I thought you were saying that, like, hey, you know, I start doing yeah, that. Yeah, let's been, go. Dude, I've been doing it. <laughs> let's, let's get on this train. Um, yeah. Welcome back. Feeling good. Got my workout done today. A little, little training session. Can the people see me? Make sure they can see me. Listen to this. <clears throat> That's not at all what you thought it was going to be. Okay, so that brings us to our first sponsor, Honeycrisp Apple. Is that, that's a honey crisp, isn't it? Yeah. Those are the best apples. And if anyone says anything different, you can go ahead and unfriend me and leave. Bye. Yeah, no Granny Smith. Don't even bring up Red Delicious, Fuji. Those are garbage. Okay, so first sponsor, Honey Crisp Apples. Honey Crisp Apples. Yeah. Number two is uh, Light Lemon Lime Lightning Kill Cliff. Mm-hmm. Crush it anytime. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then AirPods. And Bic. No, that's Pilot. Or is that Bic? Bic. Bic? Bic Pilot? Bic Velocity. Okay. Cool. This is the pen I had to leave the live stream for so I could take my notes that I'm not taking. So I've got a, a two cool personal updates that I want to give to the people. Sure. Number one is uh, my new shorts that I got today. See this? I'm very proud of these. Got them. They came in the mail yesterday. Um, the trusty Lulu, this is called the short, the 11 inch versions, because Rob Rivera said my previous 9 inch versions were showing a little too much thigh. Rob Rivera. A little too much thigh. Rob Rivera. Yes. Come on. I uh, said my quads were not uh, massive enough to be showing off that kind of thigh. So. Did he say that? No, I'm just putting words in his mouth. But it definitely sounds like right. something he would say. I was so say we're going to. So that's update number one that nobody cares about. Number two, I think some people will care about, we finally have some movement in the sewer repair at the Martin household. That's so, a really big deal. Yeah, because that started back in, I don't know, September, October time. It's the reason we had to cancel Friendsgiving. It's the reason we haven't rescheduled Friendsgiving. So they finally, months after the initial eruptions, plural, uh, we have a massive trench in the middle of our uh, front yard, driveway, and all that kind of stuff right now. So, um, yeah, they're busy putting in a brand new sewer line so that, as they say, the poopy water can continue to flow downhill. <laughs> so that's pretty big. I'm, I'm pretty happy. I could go home with a smile on my face on that. But I know we got a lot to get to. Got a hard out at 11.30 today. Another? Another hard out? That's like right. Some sort of celery? Celery? <laughs> celery? This podcast also brought to you by Celery. Yes. I feel like long time or consistent podcast listeners that have listened week after week hearing that announcement about the... You should have done that on the mic. No, that was crisp. That was a crisp can open. Mm. But uh, long time podcast listeners would be like... Dang, I can't believe that construction is getting done. Like, if you've been listening since September, October, we've talked about it. Yeah. So much. So that's that's cool to hear. You sent a cool picture yesterday of everybody working in the yard. Yeah, they had seven, no, six trucks yesterday, and these guys were shovels in hand. I mean, they were they were getting after it. It was no government work, as they say. But you know, it's funny about that. So it's not only like CFG people that are keeping tabs on me and my sanity with regard to the situation. Uh -huh. um, uh, one of my gyms that I mentor up in New York State, who also happens to be a mentor for um, my team at Two Brain Coaching, his name's Sean, 
um, he, he loves asking like, you know, big, deep questions. And he, so I told him, you know, that finally, uh, no, I'm sorry. He asked me about a week ago, Hey, you know, I hope you got your plumbing fixed by now. And I said, Nope, still no fix. And he texted me back and he said, I'm sorry. Your experiences must be incredibly challenging. I wonder what the lesson you were being called to learn is. What do you think? I was like, Oh, well, that's pretty uh, profound. That's some good self-awareness he's looking for. And when I first got that message, I was like, forget you, man. Like, the lesson is that these people are stupid. <laughs> no, but really, I said patience. I believe this is a great lesson in patience. So Nice. Yeah. Patience is a virtue. It is. I remember it is. being forced to repeat that over and over in preschool. And yeah. it's just funny because it works because I still say it all the time. Yeah. My uh, dad used to say that all the time. I saw your dad last night. You did? Yeah, he, uh, your mom and him came by here after That's the right. tryouts. Yeah, the, to uh, work out. That's right. I guess he had his baseball tryout last night. Let's not get started on that, right? <laughs> <We're> because <laughs> we don't have enough time for that. But here's the Cliff's notes. Tryouts for eight-year-olds are stupid <laughs> in any sport or any endeavor. Really? All right. Really? Anything? Oh, no, anything? No, this is it. I'm going to make the statement. Like, 14 and under, tryouts are stupid. And 14 you, and under? 14 and under, it's stupid. So, you basically, under high school, there's... Yeah, there's no reason. What about for travel ball? No. <laughs> You're going to know real quick in practice number one if this kid is going to be okay or not. Yeah. You know? It'd be easier if, like, everybody, like, so the say, say they got rid of tryouts, but as you played, you were assigned some sort of rating, right? Yeah. Now, this is, like, super Black Mirror episode, but, like, say you were assigned some I've sort of I've never watched that, but I heard it's a really good show. I've seen maybe two and a half episodes, mm -hmm. but the entire idea is that, like, technology and control yeah. our life and stuff, almost like it's doing now, but on a whole different degree. But it's, like, if you, like, say everybody was assigned some sort of athletic rating, and at, you know, when they first started, like, say you start playing soccer at three or four years old or baseball at three or four years old, you know, playing t-ball or whatever, and, you know, you're assigned this rating, and that rating never goes away throughout life, so it's almost like you have this athletic profile that sticks with you. It'd be a lot easier to do that and, like, keep track of that than do tryouts year after year after year, because then it's like, okay, well, we can just group all the kids, like, with a similar average together, or you know, each team has to have an average score of this. So that way you have have some players with this and some players with that. See how bad as dumb as that look. That actually exists. What? For so, little kids? For like little league? For, yeah, so there are and I, I know it specifically in soccer, um, the twins, um, Alyssa and Alexis, I remember talking to their mom, they played soccer. And I remember talking to Mama D, Donna. And she said that uh, they, this uh, soccer organization they played in, from the time they were real young, they would get this like digital card that followed them around to all these different organizations. So it's like, oh, this person, like this is like their athletic, you know, grade. Wow. And I think that is the dumbest, one of the dumbest things I've ever heard. What? And I'll just go back to the trial thing before we actually get into what the people actually care to hear about. Maybe they care to hear about this. Yeah, that's what chapter markers are for, right? We exactly. have a chapter marker You're right. called so introduction and this. banter. This is what it is. So imagine if when somebody wanted to come in and enroll their kids in our kids' or teens' fitness classes, and I said, oh, well, we, we only have, you know, two different seasons that kids can come and do this, and you're going to have to try out, and then we're going to place you to make sure that things are fair or whatever the silly justification is that that and I and I and I believe me I know the other side I've been immersed in you know youth sporting culture for my entire life trust me I've seen all the different sides of it and it's still stupid it it is I say that as somebody who played it who watched my brothers play it my dad and all this kind of stuff that is Interesting. It's almost like what we're trying to focus on more in the gym is like, hey, you know, we want we want to remember why we're doing this in the first place, right? Like everything we talked about on the podcast is like, okay, you remember, you're like, go back to your original goal and like why you're doing it. And it's like it's almost like parents get caught up in the you've called it shiny object syndrome. Yeah. It's like, ooh, like 
I want to do this or I want to do that. Ooh, I want to win. Ooh, I want to play travel ball. And it's like, why did you sign your four-year-old son up like years ago for a t-ball in the first place? Yeah. It's like to have fun, to get outside, right. like to get social, or like all those reasons. Why are you introducing some sort of hierarchy to it? Yeah. Like an A team, B team, C team, stuff like that. Yeah, and for those that are well, you know, they they need that exposure. Or they they got to get their reps in, or you know, that way they can get seen. Let me let me give you the statistics on on what we know. Your kid is probably not going to be a professional, and that is okay. <clears throat> Caveat: And if they are that good, they will get found. Right. Even if you play one season and you play multiple sports, which, when you actually look at the data, shows that that is the best way to become well-rounded, stay injury-free, or reduce your risk of injury, so on and so forth. If you're good enough, you're going to be found just fine. And that's it. That's it. We can end it there. Bang. Okay. Um, we have some upcoming announcements, or we really... I mean, they're not upcoming announcements, they're current announcements for upcoming events. Yes. That's what's going on now. So the first one is the Consistency Challenge that is starting here in five days. We are five days away from that starting, which means you have today, Wednesday, tomorrow, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So five more days, and really, by the time you hear this, about four, four and a half days to sign up for that if you're interested. Um, Stephanie, man, she is, she is on my case about doing it. She is like, <laughs> she is like, yeah, get on it, get on it. Um, whoa, she's getting aggressive here. So yeah, consistency challenge that's coming up, um, and then we have the Alafia 5K trail run uh, that is coming up on the 31st. So that is on Sunday, the 31st. Um, and so we're we're really looking forward to that. I think we've talked about that enough at length on the, the podcast about how much fun that is. Do it. Just sign up and do it. I have an evening people and actually funny enough we have a ton of people that work out in the mornings and funny enough because it's at morning time that they're like yeah I'm, I'm doing it. I'm signing up. We have I think so far for the people that have showed interest a bigger group than we had last year which is pretty cool. Yes. Um, but there are people in the evening they're like well, who's doing it? Like, who's doing it? Like, everybody. Yeah, and we're like, I'm like, just about everybody in the morning. How about this? I'm doing it. Yeah, Josh is doing it. There you go. That's so right. you should do it. And uh, <laughs> if you, like, if you don't like running, this is the 5K you should do. Because it's not like regular running. If you love running, you're probably going to love this even more. Oh, yeah. That's kind of like my pitch. Like, Tampa races should probably pay us the amount of times we've shouted out their race. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> they're, they're an unofficial <laughs> sponsor. So, interesting, I remember last year when we did it, Deb uh, Pond went out there and she ran it, and her son Weston ran it too, and so I, we were in here, I think it was Monday morning, um, when we were both working out at the 9 a.m. class, I asked her, and she said, yeah, Weston will be running it again too, so that's, cool. that's, that's pretty neat, yeah. yeah, he was flying, I remember seeing him. Yeah, so I know so far, just because it's off the top of my head, Zach has shown an interest, Natalie has shown an interest, you, me, Stephanie, Emily, Jennifer Berry, and her son Tyler, uh, who's actually also doing the Spring Classic in March, so that's pretty cool. Um, and who else? There's somebody else that I was thinking of. There's one or two other people I was thinking of, I can't remember, so that's at least 10 we're at right now, um, which is cool. So, sign up for that 5K. Bam, do it. Um, yeah. And then was there, I see one more on there. Yeah, I put question marks. I didn't know if we're sharing that because I know last week we didn't share it. But yeah, yeah, go ahead. Day. If we've got the date for it, yeah. Yeah, so February 27th, we are doing another snatch clinic. This is with Coach Gene. We did one, by the time this one comes around, it would have been maybe like eight months, six to eight months prior. So um, this is our, we could call it our annual or biannual snatch clinic that Coach Gene is putting on. If you're interested in improving your Olympic weightlifting and you see people doing it and you see what Barbell Club's doing, you're like, I want to do that, this is the clinic for you. Bam. But even if you haven't done it before and you're like, what is it? I want to get better at it. If you're just, if you have that kind of drive, this is the clinic for you. So this is meant for all levels. This is a working clinic. It's two hours of, I mean, Gene does, I, I saw this um, happen in the first one, is it was, it's a quick introduction. Hey, I'm Gene. All right, we start warming up. You start warming up and then you're lifting and doing drills and stuff. And I mean, it's two hours of, of working. movement. 
Yeah. yeah so uh, it's a really cool clinic uh, to improve your Olympic lifting if that's something you're interested in. If you have any questions, reach out to one of the coaches. Uh, we plug Coach Gene's email. It's just Gene, G-E-N-E, -E, at coachingforglory.com. Um, or just really ask any one of the coaches and we'll get an answer for you within 24 hours. Boom. Boom. Keep moving. All right. So we have some listener questions. Let me just take some notes real quick. We have some listener questions. Um, and we have really one that's kind of like a two or three parter and it's something we wanted to talk about last week. So this is, uh, we're going to talk about how progressions work within a program. So how we progress, um, different ways throughout a program instead of just going heavier every single time you come in. And then we also have, this is what we wanted to talk about last week, workout learnings. What are you thinking about mid-workout? So yes. two listener questions, but kind of like last week, we're probably going to cover way too much. So Josh, I'll ask you this one first, and then I'll take my turn. Um, listener question number one. How does progression work within a program design? Meaning, can we keep increasing the reps we're doing with a given weight? And how do we progress different ways throughout the program? Yes, so how does progression work within a program design? So first, what you have to think about is a couple of components individually. Number one is the person, and we talked about this at length a couple episodes ago, but you have to consider the person and their ability to um, adapt and recover from the stimulus or the stress that is put on them. So you have to consider the person. Um, you have to consider um, what the actual modality is that you are utilizing. So it could be a weightlifting, it could be a cyclical or monostructural, it could be a gymnastics or a body weight piece. So you have to consider the modality. And then you also have to consider what the intent of you know, the, the person and the actual movement progression is. And then that actually gives you what we would call, or actually what like the medical community would call is the, the dose, like the response that you get to the dose where the dose response, right? So you have to consider those things um, when you first start to think about how does progression work. The, the next thing is, okay, we go back to that person, is what is the, the person's, you know, priority and end goal? And so when we think about, say, for the program design that we're putting in place with the group right now, the, the top line priorities are, you know, upper body, vertical pulling, and scapular control, which we're achieving through a lot of work in that hollow and arch position. So I know specifically... Um, what this question's intention was is can we keep increasing the reps we're doing with a given weight of a given movement? So, great example is we've been doing floor presses with dumbbells for a while. And the first week it was 10 each arm. The second week we were doing, excuse me, three sets of 10 each arm. The second week was 12. The last week was, um, wait. 8, 10, 12. 8, 10, 12. Okay, so... Um, basically 16 reps, 20 reps, 24 total reps, but again, they're alternating split between each arm. And our um, prescription to individuals has been, no, it's fine. Our prescription to individuals has been, we want you to use the same weight throughout each of these progressions. And kind of the way that we look at things is we didn't, just take it as, okay, week one, we want you to use the heaviest weight that you can for those eight reps. We want you to use a weight where when you get done, it feels like, okay, I could have done a lot more. Or man, we've all had that feeling like, I should have done more weight. And I don't know why that is, and that's probably a rabbit hole that we could go down another time. But, but the reason that that was the intention as stated from the coaches to each of the members is because we know it's not about week one we know that it's about week three, four, five because right. of what's coming. Which right? we're answering now. Like this is week three. It's like things are yeah. getting real. Yeah. So for, uh, for, like personally, I used 40 pounds that first week and I was thinking, oh, this is this is pretty easy. 
Second week, it was, I was thinking, okay, this is starting to become a challenge. And this last time, the last iteration that we did it, I mean, that felt like a lot of reps. So to, to his question, how does progression work within a program design? Well, there's a, um, what do we got? Five different ways that you can think about, and this is at a very elementary level, but the, a way that you can think about progressing in the design of somebody's program. So you can do it through sets. So we could go from three sets of eight to four sets of eight. That's one form of progression. You could go change the reps up. So instead of three sets to four sets, you could keep it three sets. And like you've seen with us, as we go three sets of eight to three sets of 10, and then you could start to increase the reps over time. Um, you could also play around with tempo. And this is something that you've seen with other movements that we've had spaced sporadically. The goblet squat, we're controlling the eccentric. Um, the, the seated banded pull downs, we're controlling the eccentric. And what we mean by control is we're actually sticking a time limit to how long that contraction should be stretched out. Three seconds, five seconds. So that's uh, sets, reps, tempo, rest, time domain. So if I lengthen the amount of rest that um, somebody is getting in between a given effort or set in something, it stands to reason that your ability to recover and express that same characteristic again um, would increase, meaning you're going to recover enough to do the same amount of work again. As I decrease that rest, things are going to get more and more and more challenging. So right now, I think we're doing supersets, and correct me if I'm wrong, but we're saying rest two minutes. Mm -hmm. So we could do three sets of eight in week one. In week two, we could do three sets of eight again, but take the rest from two minutes to 90 seconds. And then in week three, from 90 seconds to 60. And then in week four, from, you know, you yeah. see what I'm doing each time. But that's only one variable that I'm changing. And so you can quickly understand that progression, there is just so many different ways. And the astute but that the astute listener will say, well, wait a minute, there's one that he hasn't even mentioned yet, and it is the last one, and we purposely put it last because all the other four, sets, reps, tempo, and rest, it really doesn't matter in somebody's program design. Now, this is a very general statement. Individually, I would say that it does, but in a general sense, I don't really care if you progress sets or reps or tempo or rest. Those are to me all interchangeable. What order you go in? Oh, am I gonna? This is where coaches can kind of get lost in the weeds. Well, should I do three sets of eight and then three sets of ten, or should I go three sets of eight and then four sets of eight? Like, well, just pick one and go with it, yeah. and then we need to see what happens. And then follow that progression. Exactly, and then stick with it because then and only then can we figure out, hey. If their adherence has been good, what is the efficacy of this program saying? And your pen came apart. I didn't even notice. Okay, but let's get to the last one, which is the one that people are probably pointing out now that we haven't mentioned, and that would be that of load. So load is the last thing that we would actually use as a progression for something. The reason being is that when we're adjusting um, sets and reps in particular, what we're actually doing is getting a lot of good practice and repetition or what backroom coaches talk would be described as like motor control, okay? Um, tempo and rest, what we're actually allowing the body to do physiologically is, you know, recover, but more so than that is to build up things like lent, the tend I always get these, the first couple letters mixed up, tendon and ligament strength. Mm -hmm. So we're doing that. So the things that really kind of keep the body stable and able, we're spending time there. Load is going to be the last way that we would increase the progression. So to go back to how does pro progression work within a program design, very deliberately, very intelligently, with intention, understanding the person, the modality, in order to figure out where do they need to go next. Yeah. That's the way the progression works. It's not, oh, I've been doing 50, can I do 55? Well, 
let's actually progress up through all these other areas first before we say, okay, you should increase the load that you are actually putting on your body. Yeah. So it's, it's funny thinking about it now and kind of thinking through this as you were talking just now is we kind of almost like we'll reverse engineer it when we're in person coaching, like when we're on the floor. So say for example, like we're doing the floor press or the seated banded pull downs and someone's like, Hey, like Josh, Mark, do you mind watching this real quick? Because I'm, uh, you know, I'm having a rough time with this. It just feels wonky. Can you watch this? We're like, okay. One of the first things we're going to say is like, all right, slow it down. I'm going to watch you real quick. Right. So like, even without real, even us realizing it is like, we've controlled the tempo, yes. right? So we've just controlled the tempo. We've said, okay, like slow it down a little bit, or we might say, rest a little bit longer. Like, okay, like take two minutes, like take two minutes and then let me watch you. Right. Cause we want to see what it looks like. After we have seen that first, say it's, you said you use the forties. Say yeah. you're doing floor press with one twenties, hundred pound, dumb, 120 pound dumbbell in each hand. Right. right. And it's like, like after I've already said, all right, slow it down, rest two minutes. So I've controlled tempo and rest. And I've seen physically seen one lift. The, if it doesn't look good, one of the first things I'm going to say is, all right, Josh, like, let's drop weight. Let's go back. So like the very first thing that we actually manipulate after watching a movement is load. Yeah. Always. So it's almost like because we've named these five different modalities, right? Sets, reps, tempo, rest, and load. Those first four are in no particular order, but that last one has to be last. Now, okay, when we're going in reverse, it's, okay, we got to manipulate load first. Yeah. And it's, okay, maybe now you're working with, 40s and 40s are looking good. Okay, now I want you to complete what we do. When was the last? What we did this week? Three sets of 12 on each side, right? And now that looks good. So then we can play around with sets, reps. So it's like without us even realizing it, we're manipulating all of these modalities. But load is always going to be the last one. And so it's funny because Josh, you and I, something a little different that's been happening. Um, the last couple of weeks versus, you know, say the last year or two years is you and I have actually been collaborating on the programming. And, and so it's not just one person spitting out what's happening. It's both of us kind of talking about what the class is doing. And so I think you can appreciate this, but people ask is, Hey, you know, not like, you know, questioning, but they'll just be like, okay, so I'm staying the same weight as last week because that's something we're not used to. You know, we're so used to going heavier than we did last week right. and heavier than we did last week. And there's a time and place for that, almost like what, maybe when you get more exposure to a movement, like a good morning or a floor press, like, okay, like if you felt comfortable with the 40s after the first week, maybe you'll go to 45s if right. you felt super, super comfortable. But it's not like you're going from 40s to 60s. Yeah. Right? And so we'll always say like, okay, if you want to make this harder, like, Let's not go from 40s to 45s. Instead, on the floor press, like I want you to take three seconds on the way down. Oh man! Each bar, yeah. Right. Like, Much your, harder. Your pecs would be so sore. Um. So, yeah, it's just that there are all those different things. I'm I'm so glad you brought that up. That we manipulate first before we're like, all right, add some weight. Like it's gonna feel better once you once you add some weight. I promise. Which I see you actually just wrote that note, so I'll let you go on. Yeah, so there's two things that I think about when it comes to the load question because it, I think this is like, I don't mean this to sound sexist, but like the guys are usually the ones that are like, yeah, let's just keep loading up the bar, grabbing the heavier dumbbells, or 53 pound kettlebell, no, I can do the 70 just for, for guys being guys, right? And ladies, I'm not singling you out because we see, we see that with the ladies too, but just stick with me here. So let's say that over the past four or five weeks that you have gone up in, in your weight progression. How long do you think that's going to last? Okay, so you, you showed that you could do the 50s. If I give you 10 weeks and you went from 40 to, to 45 to 50, are you going to continue to add that amount of weight? No, you're going to be capped out in probably three short weeks. And then guess what? you're going to feel for the next however long that that movement comes up that, nope, I've gotten as good as I possibly can at this thing. Or the more likely scenario is like, oh man, I suck at this, or I'm just never going to get any better, I'm not getting any stronger. Well, there's a reason for that. So the loading piece 
you need to be incredibly patient on that and understand, and if you don't, this is why we're trying to educate you on it, but understand that in order to get into those heavier loads, if that's what you want, you need to be able to express and develop motor control. You need to have the proper innervation in your central nervous system you know, to have the maximal contractions possible to lift progressively heavier weights over the long haul. You know, people that are at the, the top of the podium of the strongest in the world, and they didn't get there by increasing the amount of weight that they lifted week after week after week. It's been year after year after decade after decade. That's why strength is actually one of the physical qualities that you can continue to increase long into your 50s and 60s and 70s. Whereas other things like cardiorespiratory endurance, stamina, flexibility, those are the things that kind of degenerate or decrease over time. So, and it's, just some food for thought. And it's funny because you would think that, and this is, again, getting back to the age of social media we're in, that by what these strongest people in the world are posting is, Man, look how much they're squatting and benching and deadlifting. Like all they're doing is squat, bench, and dead. But what they're not posting is one the hours of recovery work they're doing to be the professional athletes they are. We've talked about that a lot. But two, like the amount of work that they're doing that's actually making them strong, which is single arm floor press. It's split squats. It's Bulgarian split squats. It's accessory work that's actually correcting any imbalances and any poor movement patterns with lighter weight, seat abandoned pull downs. That's helping them control their body, get a little bit more proprioception, right? And just overall strength, balance, stability, that's actually making them strong enough to lift a thousand pounds. Yeah. And like, I haven't talked to anybody that squatted a thousand pounds, but I bet if I did and I asked like, what did you do to get to that point? They'll probably say two things. They squatted a lot and they did a ton of accessory work. And yeah. then they'll probably also just say, I've always been strong. They'll, they'll probably gonna say those because if somebody, like you said, if somebody's good enough to play a sport, they're gonna play the sport. Like they're gonna right. be a professional. If somebody squats a thousand pounds, they probably were born with like right. some sort of ability. <laughs> Crazy, like yeah, ability and genetics. And they're gonna tell you that it took them at least 10 years. At yeah. least, because I've talked to people who have squatted that much, and there, there's no twenty year olds out there doing that. No, not yet. You know, I mean, maybe mid twenties, maybe thirties, forties, but there are a lot of guys and girls equally that squat a ton of weight that are forty year older, because they've had time in the game, you know, to be able to do those things. I know we're kind of going down the rabbit hole, but one of my um, one of my favorite videos that I've watched uh, that I've watched in the past is talking about people that are seen as overnight successes. You know, an overnight success really takes at least ten years to come to fruition. Yeah. So you yeah. Know, see and understand all the work that goes on behind the scenes to get there, and that can be true in anything. It's like nobody listening to this would fall. I would hope would fall for a get rich quick scheme. If I said, hey. Let me get let me get you know a thousand dollars today, and I'll turn it into ten thousand tomorrow. Yeah. Unless I'm planning to go out and rob some banks, you know that's not going to happen. So, if you wouldn't follow a get rich quick scheme with your money, don't do it with anything else, your fitness included, and your, excuse me, your health and fitness. Like you said, we're kind of going down a rabbit hole. But what would you say to somebody that's like, well, I don't want to squat a thousand pounds, or that's not my goal, or I can't do that, like. Why, why do I still have to manipulate all these different things instead of going heavier? Because say I'm, I'm already 45 or yeah. I'm already 50, yeah. I have a limited time to get strong. What would you say to that? Yeah, well, if, if, are you saying that strength isn't, isn't the goal? Like they, they don't care about? Squatting a thousand pounds isn't. Yeah, so if it's not the number that matters, you're, you're doing fitness to support your life in, in the, the way that it personally works for you. And that's the that's part of the you and I were talking about this like messaging standpoint, but that's part of the, the message that we're trying to get to people is you know you really got to ask that question of why are you doing fitness? You know how does it support the life that you want to live? Mm -hmm. And if the life that you want to live isn't defined by some number that's on a barbell or on a dumbbell or a kettlebell, then don't worry about that. 
but the beautiful part of doing this fitness thing is that there are an infinite amount of ways that you can continue to challenge yourself and recover from, you know, that are just slightly in front of your ability today. Yeah. Right. And that's really how like a lifetime of fitness can serve you. If you tap out on the, the amount of weight you can lift in a month or a year, okay, that's it. You know, you know what actually the next progression would be? Go all the way back to the beginning and look at sets, reps, tempo, and rest. Yeah. And then magically what you're going to find is you will be able to actually progress in the weight that you are lifting. But if you don't care about it, then great. Because there's an, that's the beautiful part is there's an infinite amount of ways that we can actually continue to progress you when we look at program design through this lens. Yeah. So, yeah, bringing it all back, how does progression work within program design? Well, we progress through sets, reps, tempo, rest, and then finally load, and that's, you know, we could probably even, for our purposes and what we're doing here, X that out. You know, right. we're talking a lot about sets, reps, tempo, and rest, and that's what we're thinking about primarily. Um, the other thing, the other note that I had down here, and it, I, can, uh, I can speak to this from a, um, a member, athlete, client perspective, and also a coach perspective, you know, how many times, and I'm asking this to you, have you heard people say, oh, you know, I, I just, I need a little bit of weight on the bar for, for me to actually do this correctly, you know, or like, oh, yeah, let, let me add a little bit of weight to this deadlift and, and I'll show you how it should look. Or, oh, if I'm back squatting, I, I can't actually do the PVC. I need to get a little bit of weight on there to kind of feel things out so it looks right. I've said it and I've heard countless people say it. I am telling you that probably if I haven't heard every single person in here say it, every single person here has thought it at least once, myself right. included. And I'm not right. taking it because I'll be the first to admit yeah. I'm nowhere near perfect. I've definitely said it. I've said it like and every single person coming through foundations has said it. It's like that's something you're going to say in the first hour or two you're Except in here. Except Alex, she's never said that. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> the first hour or two you're in here, you're going to be like, man, front rack with a PVC? I'll say I'm even guilty of being the coach and saying, you know what, the bar's gonna rest on your shoulders a little bit easier once it's a little heavier, right? Like, I'm, I'm gonna be the first to admit that. Like, every single person, except for Allie, has done that, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so I think I was actually talking to Jim Godin from Exos about this a couple of years ago, we were having this, you know, kind of a coach's discussion and, you know, I asked him, you know, obviously he's seen it and what he said and he's, he's like, look, the, the reason for that is plain and simple. It's just you, you being me or that person, whoever's thinking it or saying it. One. One. Oh, is that proper pronoun? I don't know. But anyways, <laughs> you can send a note to your coach, but anyways. It's, it's now you don't you don't need more weight. You actually just need motor control. You you need to be able to control your body. And guess what? How do you how do you do that? You do it through you know quality reps, number of sets, moderating your tempo, so time under tension because it gives you more exposure and experience with that movement. Rest so that you can recover and adapt from it, and go from there. Thanks, Jim. Go ahead. Cool. Uh, let's see what do we have here. We had some comments. Stephanie said, and their nutrition. I think she's referring to when I was saying, like, if you ask somebody that squats a thousand pounds, what did you do? Yeah, so we'll include those four, we'll say five things, right? So yeah. they did their, they, they squatted a lot. They were born with the, just a gift. They did their accessory work, but Stephanie also said their nutrition, and they probably also slept a lot. Um, Allie said, not me ever. Stephanie's guilty when it comes to Olympic lifts, and Allie is laughing. Cool. Sweet. Do you hook up the microphone ever? <laughs> no, but you know what I did? <laughs> Talk about how, how embedded the hook grip is. Um, one of the, I think it was like one of the middle sets of the EMOM today, three, two, one, go on the deadlift. So it was supposed to be no hook grip. And I just out of habit reached down, grabbed it with the hook grip. And as I brought it up, I was like, uh-oh, I'm not supposed to do that. So I released it and just kept right on going. Wow. But it was, it just didn't even think about it. Yeah. That is unconscious competence. Ooh, boom. Write that down. Do you ever hook up your steering wheel? 
I used to, only because I wanted people to see the ridiculousness of how dedicated I was to yeah. networking. And I just asked, I, have. I just asked these stupid questions because I actually I switched from my left arm with this microphone to my right arm. Looks like Stephanie does hook grip driving. Yeah, yeah, there we go. Let's yeah. see. What's she say? Hook grip driving? Yeah. Nice. Yeah, and so I naturally just hook grip the microphone because it's like almost the same it's like the same diameter as one of our like fatter barbells. So I wonder, Stephanie, if you're still there, are you, do you hook grip your eating utensils, being a nutrition coach, and avid weightlifter. That would be like the pinnacle, That's right? Like um, you you just you you live and breathe, you know, your your passions that you have for weightlifting and nutrition. So you grab your fork and talk, talk. Stephanie strikes me as someone that'll eat a twenty eight ounce raw raw rare steak, hook gripping the utensil and not using a knife. <laughs> She would just grab the bone of the steak, hook grip style, you know, you can and just eat it. We're yeah. just kidding, Steph. We're just kidding. I have hook grip drive. That's really annoying. <laughs> All right. So, listener question number two. Number two. <laughs> Anchorman. Yeah. See you later. Number two. <laughs> what a great character. Um, so, last week we wanted to talk about this. We got carried away with sugar and then we talked about uh, programming again and movements. So this week we're going to talk about workout learnings. And the question was, what are you thinking about mid-workout? And so this, you know, we can use this as a teaching point to help teach people what to do during the middle of the workout. But I'm actually curious what you think about. I have a general idea. I've coached you long enough that I kind of know what you're thinking about. And then I guess I'll answer. And then, yeah. So Josh, what are you thinking about mid-workout? Well, the first thing that I'll say is what I'm thinking about mid-workout probably mirrors what I'm thinking about even before it starts. Um, I've seen the, the we've used this word a lot over the last you know year, and in particular like the last six months we've been doing these podcasts. But I've seen it a lot. You know, at the beginning of the year, people have like their word. You yeah. Know? Um, and Mandy has actually you know used this too. We've used it a bunch, but it is being very intentional. So when I am coming into the gym to work out, of course I'm always having a good time. I'm, I'm having fun. I want to smile. I want to see my people. I want to check in and, and do all those things. And those are very intentional because that's really what fills me up. But um, I think about why I am there that day, just in general, why am I here? And then I look at whatever it is that we're doing. Okay, why am I doing this thing? And I'm really concerned with making sure that I understand the connection between what I'm doing and where I want to be going. So how does this actually fit in to what my goal is or what my priority is or whatever the case may be? So I'm very intentional about that. And... Now, this goes without, um, I, I want to make sure that people get this, is that you know, I've been doing this, this whole like physical training thing for a really, really, really long time, so it's deeply embedded you know, why I'm doing things. So it's, it's a pretty, I said that earlier about unconscious competence, that's such a hard thing to say. I said that earlier, that you know, intuitively I know I have a pretty good understanding of why I'm doing something. So I carry that all the way to the beginning of whatever that session is. When I'm in the middle, I know this is kind of where the question was going, what am I thinking about mid-workout is keeping my focus on that intention. So when I start the workout, what is my goal in the workout that serves the ultimate intention of why I'm there? And what was it? Um, Monday was a really good example. It was continuous, easy movement the whole time. And so what I hear, what my brain hears when you say that or Abigail says that as the coach is, hmm, okay, so I want it to be continuous. I want it to be sustainable. So I want my each round that I do to be almost like dead on. Mm -hmm. So I, I know that in order to do that, I can't go all out like full effort. And I again, I've had enough experience and exposure to all these different types of workouts that I can settle into what my uh, 
optimal paces for sustainability from three, two, one, go. Most people take a long time, you know, to, to kind of get to that point, but it's very easy for me to settle in. But in the middle of the workout, what I'll look at is, okay, after I finish that first round, it's been six minutes. So I know six minutes is kind of the piece that I want to make sure at the end of each round, say six minutes, 12 minutes, 18 minutes, 24 minutes, 30 minutes, done. Okay, great, goal met. That's what I'm thinking about the whole workout. So understanding what the intention is of the day, understanding what the intention is of this particular block of training in the day, how does it fit in to that day? How does it fit into the overall plan? You know, but also thinking about, this has definitely changed over the last year, but just making sure, because it's, it's very easy being a competitive person to get caught up in how fast is Mark going? How fast is Jose going? Yeah. You know, what, what is, you know, or, or how much weight is Allie or Natalie lifting or Melissa? I mean, in, in any given endeavor, this is the cool part about being in here with people, uh, everybody has the thing that they shine in, right? And so it's, it's very easy, you know, we are competitive people. I'm, I just mean humans in general, not the people that are here, but just humans in general. So sometimes it is easy to get caught up in that. And one of the things I learned when the physical location was closed, just being on my own in the garage training was, it's just me and the workout. And yeah. so for several months when we came back, you know, I deliberately worked out right by the window because I could turn and look out the window the whole time and not be concerned with what anybody else is doing. Because it's very hard. But now it's very natural to me that what I think about in the middle of the workout is, I'm here for me. That's it. Do you think other people should adopt that? Um, I think that if people keep their initial intentions forefront from why they first came in, that's already there. Because nobody, no, and I, I can say this with full confidence, 100%, full stop, everything. Nobody came in here saying that they wanted to be competitive with the other people. Yeah. Mostly because you didn't know anybody and you didn't know what they could do, so why would you even say that you wanted to be competitive, yeah. right? So you came in here for you and for nobody else. So why do we get to, to the point where it stops being for you? I, I think it's just sometimes the nature of, of being in community with other people and seeing capabilities and things. But yeah, I, I think that it's super important. Um, I don't know if I was talking to you or somebody else. Oh no, it was, I was on a call with a gym owner the other day and we were just joking about this very idea of you know, when, I, when I work out, it's for me. And I, I jokingly said, because he's about my age, I said, you remember 20 years ago when we would go to the gym and we would work out? And that was it. You don't tell anybody. You don't video it. You don't post it on social media. You don't blog about it. Yeah. Or you don't. It, it, it was just, you did it for you. And he's like, isn't that funny how far things have, have come to now? Yeah. You know? And now I'm, I'm not, you know, dumping on, you know, the, the, being inspirational to people and, and things like that and showing, you know, potential. But I think before you get to that point, you have to be very comfortable with you are here for you. Nobody else. Yeah. So yeah. It's it's easy to get really lost in it. And I think that's just like you said, as humans we're very competitive. You know, and it's and I think that's why. Um, it, it's funny because I can also consider myself pretty competitive, but even, you know, thinking of my answer when I first read the question on our outline for the episode is you know, lately it's, okay, how can I do this current thing I'm doing, you know, this certain rep, right, of this set of 10, and then this set and this workout and this workout for my overall goal. Yeah. Honestly, right now is to um, shed a little bit of weight, right, because, you know, I just got a bulking, bulk season. Bulk season, season for yeah, two right? years, yeah. So I right. guess you could say I'm cutting, but not like saying that, like I was saying, I'm losing some weight that I've gained on that I'm not happy with, right, but that's why I want to lose it, right, is because I want to be 
happy, I guess. Yeah. I'm not I'm not depressed, guys. Like, but right. you, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, you know when you put on a few pounds, you're like, man, I gotta lose a few pounds. Like, and that's why I'm doing it. And it's like I'm I'm not necessarily thinking all the way like with that step as I'm doing a dumbbell thruster, but I know that like okay, like you said on Monday, Abigail's like. You want to stay moving consistently for 30 minutes. So my goal was to not take a break for 30 minutes. Yeah. And that means slowing things down, being able to focus on my breathing, because I know that if I hit the goals that are, or the stimulus that was intended by the programmers, you and I, for this workout, like it's going to get me closer to shedding that weight. Right. right? So, so I guess that's what I think about, but I guess more specifically, it's okay, this certain movement I'm on, how can I do it to the best of my ability? With like, without getting injured, because I'm also trying to stay as injury yeah. free as possible, right? So it's okay. Each rep is let's do it as let's do it as clean as possible. If something's off, I'll adjust for the next rep, right? So it's very like you said, intentional. And you actually wrote a great blog post a couple years back about Jay and his workouts and and um, yeah, maximizing the time that he was in there. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And then you wrote about how success breeds motivation and like just talking about all on how he trains and and again we, we don't want to use elite athletes like him and thousand pound squatters for you know the, use them as the gold standard but I think there's something to be said for you know the way they work out like there's a way you can still do that and not be a games athlete well, and still be you know Josh the business owner or Mark the head coach and reach your goals and be happy yeah you know? So there's a, a very, we talked about this uh, one of the earlier episodes when I came back regularly onto the podcast. Every value that is on the back of my shirt that I'm wearing right now that we have up in the gym is very uh, thought about. It was very deliberate. And the third one down is be consistent because when you, when you boil down the successes, you know, if you want to deem successes, the thousand pound squat or the games athlete, you know, go outside the realm of athletics and look at the people that are, you know, successful business people. Look at the people that are successful parents. The, the underlying fundamental principle is consistency. What do great parents do? They show up like they're there for their kids. Yeah. Like that's, that's the goal. Manny and I talk about this all the time. Like I know there's plenty of things that we've already screwed up, you know, being parents, but you can be darn certain that I am always going to show up and be there. You know, it's not about, you know, the, the house or the cars or the clothes or any of that stuff or the trips. It's, and you'll learn this too. And, and you probably still see this, like, because I know you've been really deliberate about spending quality time with your dad. Um, it's like, what, what do they want? They want you to just be there and spend time with them, you know? So that, that, that principle of consistency, and I didn't deliberately tell the story because I saw Steph's comment, but she made the comment of like, do the challenge, Mark. Well, the, the operative word that she left out of the challenge that she's running is, is it's about consistency because the people that are successful in whatever you want to do, you know, they're consistent. Yeah. I, I heard this great quote, I think it was a year or two ago, and uh, of course I see it through the, through the lens of business, but it can be anything. Um, but if, and it goes like this, if you're persistent, you'll get it. If you're consistent, you'll keep it. So people that like you, you have to say that you have this goal of like, I want to lose X pounds. I have no doubt that if people have a goal and they are determined and disciplined, that you can pretty much get any goal that you want, right? Yeah. The question is, the behaviors that you develop in service to getting there, are they sustainable? Because those are the ones that are gonna be consistent. So you, I mean, you can keep beating your head into the wall and eventually you're gonna break through, but is that consistent to continue to beat your head through that wall? Can you be consistent in that? Probably not. You know, it's so funny that you say that because in the past when I've done this, you know, either to gain weight or lose weight with my body. Because, you know, I like doing fun experiments like that. Mm -hmm. I, have, I had certain goals before, you know, getting really, really strong. And then, okay, let's get really, really conditioned for the open. And, and kind of, you know, being on the wave like that is, how I'm doing it now is, I'm not 
super concerned with the number on the scale because we've talked about how bad that is. I've never really been um, super concerned with that. Um, body composition, I'm always, I mean, you're always aware of that, you know, before you, you know, step into the shower or step out of the shower, things like that. You know, you notice things here and there, like, yeah, I mean, I'm a little bit leaner. You do a couple flexes here and there. No, yeah, yeah, always <laughs> flexing. But no, it, but the way it's kind of happening this time is focusing on, okay, let's, let's not try to be perfect. Like, let's not have extremely perfect nutrition from now until say the open or from now until next November or next December is let's just do all right like and let's keep doing all right as much as I can and like see how that holds up and mentally like I'm able to say have homemade cheeseburgers or homemade pizza for dinner because I know the other five or six nights of the week I'm going to be having a starch, a vegetable, and and uh, a protein, right? I know I'm going to be uh, eating well. So, long example, long story, just to say that this time it's that consistency that you just brought up is so crucial. I think for sustainable progress, yeah, and mental health when it comes to reaching your goals. Yeah, perfect is the enemy of done. There is a definite uh, per, uh, phenomenon of paralysis by analysis. You know, we creators have this problem. I've suffered through this problem. I'm sure you have. I'm sure Steph has. I'm sure everybody has. Where, you know, you don't want to put something out or do something or make a decision until it's, you feel like it's, it's ready, you know, until it's like perfect. But the reality is it's never going to be. So you just need to get something going and, in order to actually be able to look back and say, hmm, I did this thing, did it work? Yes, cool, I'm gonna keep doing it. You know, no, okay, now I can start to, to make some deviations. But the, the moral of the story is you just, you have to show up consistently first. Yeah. You have to get enough swings in before you know, am I taking the right swing? Yeah, another baseball reference. Unless you were talking about golf. Yeah, could be golf, <laughs> baseball, because it could definitely be golf, because I have certainly not taken enough swings to uh, to just say, you know, if I need to make some changes. We uh, we have some comments that I'm going to go through. So um, this is back when we were talking about what we think about during a workout before we kind of moved into consistency. Um, Stephanie asks, is it different depending on the workout, what you're thinking about? Um... No, because I'm still thinking about my intention and, you know, why I'm doing things. Now, when workouts are shorter in length, the thoughts kind of come and go a little bit faster. So, in meaning where in a 30-minute workout, I may be able to say a phrase to myself, okay, that took you six minutes, let's keep that pace. Like, that might be the dialogue that I'm having in my head. Mm -hmm in a just a six minute workout, it might be, I'm telling myself, move now. Yeah. Move now. Move. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, yeah. you, you, so those, are, those are the things that, uh, that change. Um, so I, I would say that the difference is just the number of words that I might use to talk to myself in my head um, versus saying, oh, I'm, I'm not really gonna think about anything. And, and I do recognize everybody's different. If you've <laughs> known me, you know, even for a, an hour, or you've listened to this for a while, um, you know that I'm a very cerebral person. I put a lot of thought behind everything, so it's no surprise to hear that I'm having conversations with myself as I'm working out. Yeah. You know? And it's not just like, you know... And not to say that this is bad, but it's not surface level. It's like, you know, deep, deep questions. You know, why, why are you here? Why are you... In the middle of a thruster. Yeah, <laughs> why am I actually doing this? And I know that sounds so silly, but it, it just, that's just me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so then she said you're thinking about that before the workout, right? Yeah, Yeah, because I did talk about what happens before, but it also carries into, you know, what happens during. Um, so Stephanie also said it would be interesting to pull some moms and women um, what goes through our minds during a workout. Now as a garage person, I have very deliberately tried to turn off my mom brain while also looking at a monitor. <laughs> so, 
Yeah, that's a, a really great point. I, I think that moms um, and women in particular could speak to this more intelligently than than uh, dads or males, but for sure, you know, um, I do think that there is a lot to be said for that because I even see it play out with Mandy, you know, when she'll go out into the garage um, to, to work out or whatever. I know just because she's my wife that she's thinking about, oh man, you know, dinner and did the kids take a bath or is Josh going to remember to put them in the bath or did I laser, you know, things out because she'll come in and she'll have one thing to say about the workout and 12 things to say about what she thought about in just life things. But I actually don't think that's a bad thing um, because there is something, and we won't go down this rabbit hole today, but there is something about the flow state when you're doing a workout that thoughts actually come out really clearly and um, yeah, so I don't, I don't think that's, that's a bad thing to, no. to kind of go through that laundry list. Because you, you do actually want to have, think about this, I, I want to have this, I want to have fitness serve me in a way that I, I become more mentally acute. Right. Not something that like diminishes my mental faculties. Yeah. So, because I see, you know, down a little bit lower, Ali said, you know, I'm thinking about, you know, I keep breathing, did I leave the coffee pot on, keep breathing, did Olivia turn in that project, keep breathing, did Mandy leave the car unlocked and all the doors open and the garage open and the front door unlocked again? Because <laughs> um, <laughs> I thought about that. But, um, yeah, so I, I do think that that's actually a really great point that she brought up because it does speak to the mental clarity that is happening. Yeah. Nicole just said some of my best thinking comes from a workout similar to a long car run. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's that's flow state. Especially with something like running, you know, because running just kind of, as long as you're not on a 5K trail run where you have to like be aware of every step you're taking, but if you, you know, say you're just running, say 200 meters in a workout or 400 meters, I mean, you got, you got a minute or two of alone time where you're just one foot in front of the other. Um, yeah, so, so let's see. Perspective, Josh, I sometimes make a checklist that helps me organize, uh, that I create in my head, or that helps me organ, stay organized and I create in my head while I'm working out, if that makes sense. It does, and funny story, so I've got a couple of whiteboards in my garage, and I can remember um, multiple times when we were working out from home, I would be in the middle of a workout, and something would pop into my head, whether it was something that I wanted to share with the, the gym or, you know, with any of the other coaches or gym owners that I work with. And I'd grab my whiteboard marker, write it up there real quick, you know, and then just get back to it. So yeah, some of my most clear thoughts for sure happen, you know, that's why I ride my bike every day for like 30 minutes. Mandy's like, oh, you're going to get away. It's like, well, no. Um, it, it's a, it's, it, it's twofold. Sometimes my bike rides are kind of, you know, that's the kind of the conclusion to my day where I can basically close the book on all the things that I had been thinking about that day, or I'll go in the middle of the day, like at lunchtime, like, you know, I might go at say 12 o'clock today. Well, not today, but I might go at 12 o'clock, you know, right before I eat some lunch, just because I need to get into that headspace of some really big picture thinking things that need to get done. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Melissa says, that is why I prefer to work out there, meaning at CFG instead of my garage, I get to check out for an hour and it's, and it's her time. Yeah. Because yeah, I'm guessing like in the garage, like kids are going to come say hi. Yeah. There. Yeah. And that's great awareness around intention. And there's, I don't think that there's, there's a wrong answer at all. I, I think that the, really the underpinning of all these, this feedback that we got is people, this is the interesting observation I just, this noticing that I had is, is people, all those statements are like, that. I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, things that are priorities to me. Stephanie with the monitor and the baby and being a mom and a woman, Allie thinking about the family and the kids and you know, leaving the coffee pot on. Maybe she needs to get one with an auto off feature. But anyways, um, <laughs> I'm sure she does. But, you know, Melissa recognizing that, like, this is, she said at the very end, it's, it's my time. So the, the underpinning principle is that this is for me. Yeah. It wasn't about, uh, I, I need to 
progress load or do this faster or anything. It's like, I'm, I'm here for me. And I think understanding and being aware of your intention and, and kind of noticing those things, I think is, is huge. And the more that you can keep that in your mind that this is, I'm doing this for me and this is why and understanding and, and keep asking that question. Cause I still do. And I've been, uh, let's see, I've been doing fitness for, I think the first time I ever got drugged to the gym to work out, I was probably like 12, you know, so like two, almost two and a half decades. Um, and I've been a coach for almost 20 now. And I still ask myself that all the time. It's, yeah, I was, yeah, I was going to say something, but it's pretty much just a of what you said. I'm, I'm like also reading these comments because now we got, you know, we had, we were up to eight viewers. It's awesome. We got a bunch of people sending in some um, comments. So Jody says, uh, it's me time and I vow to leave it all at the door when I walk in. I focus on the workout and the friends when I'm there. My clarity comes when I work out. Uh, Stephanie says another benefit to exercise is not physical. Yeah, so all those things, all the things we've been saying, there's just, yeah. Good discussion. So that's a, that's a really great point, you know, that kind of I can combine what, you know, what my mom said about kind of leaving things at the door and clarity, you know, when she walks out and Steph's saying it's a, another benefit to exercise that's not physical is the the difficulty that we have as coaches in the fitness industry and then members have as participants in fitness is that so much of uh, exercise and tension is wrapped around this idea of physical change and there is so like that's the that's one that what we talk about our four pillars of sleep eat move and manage like that's one bucket um, that it is affected, right? Like that's the physical side, but the stress management, the nutrition, the sleep, like all these are different areas to improve upon. So think about like, you know, cognitive function, um, think about appreciation of great relationships that you have. So these are all benefits and it's, it's hard when you wrap your quote unquote success with your physical fitness in just one ideal that is physical. Because how, how do I measure, and this is kind of a rhetorical question, but I am interested in your thoughts as we're bumping up against like, you know, the, 30, the 1130 mark, but how do I measure if a year from now, if I'm happier or more cognitively aware or if my stress is lowered, you know, how do I objectively measure those things? How do you objectively measure love? I heard Simon Sinek talk about this yeah. um, with an interview that he did. He's like, no, like, do you love your wife? The guy says, yeah. He goes, okay, can you tell me, you know, when? Like, and tell me, explain that to me. It's like, how, how do you objectively measure that? Right. You know, it's such a subjective thing. And that's part of the difficulty of being in the, the fitness industry is there's so much marketing and all this that is tied up in the physical and it's like yeah but you know if 10 years from now my outside appearance is exactly the same does that mean that it was a failure if i'm more cognitively mentally acute um if my relationships are better if i've learned how to manage stress better if i'm sleeping with more quality was that a failure well, no, but yeah, I know what you're saying. Yeah, you know, and, um, you know, I love Emily jumped in there and she said exercise is medicine. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, um, I'll never forget my pastor said this uh, several years ago when we were at church and he was talking about, you know, getting into small groups and the, the, the benefits of being together with the community. And he said, life change happens in the context of relationships. And that's really profound and it's, it's really, it, that's weighed heavily on me over the last year when I look at CFG and, um, you know, just what we went through over the last year with the physical shutdown and things like that is that, um, you know, really when we say like coaching, like that's just a fancy word or a different word for a relationship. Yeah. It does now. The crazy thing is it doesn't scale, but I don't like, that's fine. Yeah. 
because it's it, we're really looking for the life changing part. In an in an app that just feeds you something doesn't do that. It, at least that's not what I want. No. You know. But it's not what works. Yeah. But in the long run, you know, any, any sort of app or generalized sort of template will work in the short run, absolutely. But in the long run, yeah. No, it's not what works. I don't know how long these people listened on this thing, but I'm really, um, really appreciative. Before we go, I do want to say that I, I love the interaction. I'm glad that we kind of touched on some things that people just felt compelled to to share their thoughts on too. And, and I'm, I'm happy to talk to anybody about this stuff. I love it. So yeah, thank um, you guys. Yeah, thank you for um, thank you for participating. Absolutely. Thank you to our live viewers. If you guys listen to this show on Buzzsprout or SoundCloud or Apple Podcasts, I don't have to do a whole outro because we have a new outro. Josh's voice is going to take it away from here on out. I will just remind you to leave a five-star written review. If you can, ask us questions. We'll get them answered on the next show. Here's Josh to take us away. Thanks, guys.